idea of angels has been of great comfort and inspiration to Christian believers like Billy Graham, like John Calvin, Martin Luther, and maybe you too, maybe, and certainly to non-Christians alike. Billy Graham also pointed out in his book's introduction that angels have a much more important place in the Bible than the devil and his demons. To which I say, amen, Billy Graham. Angels do have a far greater influence on people in the stories in our Bible, the Old Testament and the New, than does Satan, that so-called devil. And since that's true, Billy Graham asks, why does the devil get so much more attention from writers than angels do? Some people seem to put the devil on a par with God. And actually, Billy Graham writes, Satan is a fallen angel. I don't want to get into a debate with the late, great Dr. Graham, but his assertion that Satan is also an angel complicates the discussion of angels portrayed in the Christian gospel. And so I hope you will pardon me if I do not go there in this, my very first ever sermon about angels. One last story from a fairly popular writer, if I may be permitted, which captures in part some of America's fascination with angels. This is from Jerry B. Jenkins, the co-author of that wildly popular Left Behind series of books. In a story that was published by Guideposts in 1995, all night, all day, angels watching over me. The book's editor writes, and I quote, Jerry Jenkins is one of those people who was brought up believing that he had a guardian angel. But since he'd never seen one or, or knew anybody who had, he could only accept it by faith. He has still never seen one, so far as he knows, but over the years, he's become a firm believer in their existence. It started with an incident that occurred during the morning years of his life. It scared and bewildered him at the time, so much so that for a long while, he could not bring himself to tell anybody about it. He didn't want to be thought of as kooky. So here's how he tells his story. As a child, one of the highlights of my week was playing tag in the parking lot after church on Sunday nights. We kids would burst from the sanctuary of the Oakwood Bible Church in Kalamazoo and race among the cars in the parking lot. My brothers and I waited for the last verse of the last hymn so we could run into the dark parking lot filled with Chevys and Fords for our wild game of tag. In 1960, when I was 10, I was the youngest and smallest of the Sunday night regular tag players, boys and girls, ages 10 to 14. I had the knack for being the first down the back steps, through the foyer, the first to set foot out on the sidewalk, and once I was outside, I ran, and the game had begun. One particular fall night, I had maneuvered myself to a seat at the end of the pew, closest to the door. At the crack of dismissal, I leapt out into the aisle, ran down the stairs, out into the pitch dark night. Yes, I made it. No one was even close behind me. By habit, I took a hard left along the sidewalk close to the building and then sprinted with all my might toward the parking lot. And just past the edge of the building where the sidewalk ended, wham! An arm as firm as an oak caught me in the stomach. My hands and feet flew out ahead of me, but the arm held me upright until I could stand again. Dazed with my breath slowly coming back, I looked down at a, a sight I could hardly believe. I was standing, teetering at the edge of a huge, deep crater. I staggered back, and then I remembered the parking lot had been excavated that week. I myself had watched the bulldozer dig the foundation for a new sanctuary. I'd played sidewalk supervisor as my dad and others had slid a truckload of cinder blocks down a wooden ramp and made piles of them in that hole. For a long time, writes Jerry Jenkins, I just stood, 
thinking about what might have happened. I would have fallen in. I would have hit those cinder blocks. I'd been knocked out cold. And the night was so dark, no one would have found me until morning. And by then it would have been too late. I pictured the headlines. Jenkins boy found dead. But the arm that saved my life. Whose arm was it? The truth was I'd been saved by something I couldn't see. By someone I couldn't see. I couldn't explain the mystery and it scared me. I did tell my mother at least part of the story. After church, I almost fell in the hole, I said. But I couldn't tell her about being caught up short by an invisible arm. <laughs> that was too spooky to admit. Only as the years went by did I begin to connect that arm at my waist with the guardian angel I had always wondered about. Unquote. These stories about angel encounters, such as his, are many. And the stories are moving. And the stories are memorable. I call them incredible. With all the ambiguity such a word entails. It's incredible because they are not credible. They are not believable. And yet they are incredible because they are so astonishing. In a skeptical age such as ours, it's very easy to express disbelief in things that are out of the ordinary. When things are entirely unexpected, totally surprising, we're amazed, perhaps we're even frightened. When something is implausible, let alone when it is invisible, it's hard to find any words to express what's actually happening. I get that. So when Zechariah expressed doubt to the angel Gabriel that his aging wife would become pregnant, and Mary too wondered at the angel's message regarding her own pregnancy, I can understand their incredulity. I can understand their fear and their anxiety. And when in the middle of the night, a messenger from God awakens the shepherds to announce the birth of the baby Messiah in Bethlehem, I'm not surprised that the first words out of those angelic messengers' mouths would be, fear not. I can imagine it would be frightening to be startled awake by invisible voices. Regardless of the message they came to deliver, regardless of how much good news, this is spooky stuff when you stop to think about it. The subsequent host of heavenly angels singing the hallelujah chorus, which I suspect was intended to augment and to affirm the initial announcement, that strains credulity all the more. Skeptics and disbelievers who dismiss accounts of angels would simply double down their denials. If it sounded like nonsense before, it's worse. Like science fiction or like fantasy. It's just too incredible to be acceptable to their common sense worldview. Those incredible angels. My, oh my. So what do you do with them? What do you do with those stories? Do these stories about angels help convince you and inspire your faith? Or do they get in the way? Well, my 20 minutes for this sermon are up. We'll just have to come back to this topic next Sunday. Now imagine that. After 35 years of not preaching any sermon about angels ever, can you imagine I'm going to be doing two in a row? That's incredible. <laughs> Amen.